Michael's Mission by Rudolf Steiner, Lecture 4, Dornark, 28th of November 1919. Carrying on from various points I made during last week's talks, what I have to say today will be a preparation for the lectures tomorrow and the day after. This will be a matter of reminding you in a different way about certain aspects which we shall need in order then to continue with our theme. In order to gain clarity about the course of earthly evolution, it will be best to proceed by always relating events to a specific focal point as regards their significance for earthly evolution. Relating them in this way will enable us to perceive a degree of structure in which the individual human being's own development is involved through the development of humanity as a whole. This focal point is, of course, as you know, the mystery of Golgotha, through which the whole of earthly evolution has gained its meaning, its true inner content. When we refer back to the development of Western humanity, which received the impulse of the mystery of Golgotha like an impact from the Orient, we can describe how, around the 5th century before this mystery of Golgotha, a kind of preparation for it began to emerge from the culture of ancient Greece. We can say that there was a certain consistent trend in Greek thinking, feeling and will throughout the four centuries and a half, which led up to the advent of the mystery of Golgotha. This consistent trend received its introduction through the figure of Socrates, before continuing on in all of Greek culture. The same trend is noticeable even in art and in the prodigious, towering personality of Plato, before gaining an increasingly learned character in Aristotle. As you know from various descriptions of mine, the Middle Ages, and especially the period after Augustine, was a time when efforts were made to gain guidance from the thinking of Aristotle in order to comprehend everything connected with the mystery of Golgotha, its preparation and its ongoing resonance. That is why Greek thinking in particular became so important also for the development of Christianity in the Occident up to the end of the Middle Ages. It was Greek thinking which was used to penetrate the content of the mystery of Golgotha. So it would be useful to gain an understanding of what was happening in Greece during the centuries leading up to the impact of the mystery of Golgotha. What was pay taking place in the thinking, feeling and will of Greek human beings was the finale of an early culture of humanity, which is no longer appreciated today. Current historical considerations are truly not capable of seeing such things as they really were, because our current historical considerations do not reach back to a mystery culture which ranged across the whole of the civilised world and imbued all human will and feeling. It is important for us, in going back to the millennia no longer reached by historical research, to apply the methods which are at least hinted at in my book Occult Science in order to understand the nature of that ancient human culture. That culture originated in the mysteries, those ancient mysteries to which the great leading initiates admitted individuals who were objectively deemed fit also to receive direct initiation. Through those leading initiates, the knowledge they had received from the mysteries streamed forth into other human beings. It is not really possible to comprehend ancient culture as a whole without paying attention to the matrix of mystery culture. If only we want to listen, Aeschylus tells us quite clearly about that matrix of the mysteries. We can also sense it in Plato's philosophy, but the revelations about the divine which humanity actually received from the mysteries have become lost historically. Only in a most primitive sense is there anything left of them in the culture now discernible to history. Well, what actually happened in those times can best be assessed by investigating what of the ancient mystery culture actually remained behind in the post-Socratean age of Greek culture. It is a certain kind of thinking, a certain kind of imagining which has been retained. As you know, in external history one is told how Socrates founded dialectics, how he was actually the great teacher of thinking, of that kind of thinking which Aristotle subsequently developed more scientifically. However, what was actually incorporated in Greek thinking and imagining was only the last remnant of mystery culture, a mystery culture which had actually been brimful of content. 
In the overall view of human history, certain spiritual facts are known about what are the fundamental causes of our world order. But the real content, the great and mighty content, has gradually faded away. What has remained is the type of thinking developed by the mystery pupils, the way of imagining, the configuration of thinking, and this has become historical. First it was historical in Greek thinking, and then in medieval thinking, the thinking of the Christian theologians who for the most part adapted Greek thinking for their theology, using the thought forms, the ideas and concepts emanating from Greek thinking, in order to comprehend what flowed into the world through the mystery of Golgotha. Medieval philosophy, so-called scholasticism, is certainly a coming together of the spiritual truths of the mystery of Golgotha with Greek thought. The elaboration, the working out in thought of the Golgotha mysteries was certainly accomplished using, not to put too fine a point on it, the tools of Greek thinking, of Greek dialectics. Prior to the mystery of Golgotha, there had been four and a half centuries during which the fading of ancient mystery content had been going on while its merely formal thought content had come to the fore. Yes, approximately four and a half centuries. So we have to imagine a period of prehistory spreading the mystery culture across what was civilised earth. This is then further developed in such a way that only a distillation remains. Greek dialectics, Greek thinking, and then the mystery of Golgotha comes to pass. In the West, it is initially comprehended on the basis of Greek dialectics. Those who want to enter fully into the science upon which this theology was still based, let's say in the 10th, 11th, 12th, 13th and 14th centuries, cannot use our present way of thinking because our thinking is based on the manner of the natural scientist. Those who nowadays want to form a judgment about scholasticism can usually not do it justice because their schooling is the schooling of the natural sciences while scholasticism presupposes a different way of schooling one's thinking. Today we are living at a point in time when a further four and a half centuries have passed since that other way of thinking, the scientific way, took hold of humanity. This began in the middle of the 14th century. That was when in the West people began thinking in the manner well developed to some extent by Galileo or by Giordano Bruno. This way of thinking has lasted into our own time. It has the appearance of being the same logic as Greek logic, and yet it is utterly and completely different. It is a logic which has been derived from natural processes in the same way as Greek logic was derived from what the mystery pupils beheld in the mysteries. So now let us endeavour to be clear about the difference that exists between the four and a half centuries which preceded the mystery of Golgotha and the virtually only civilised world of that time the Greek world, and our own four and a half centuries during which humanity has been trained by natural science. The best way for me to demonstrate this is by drawing, see plate six. Imagine the mystery culture as a kind of chimborazo of human nature in very ancient times. This is the white. This mystery culture then becomes logic in Greece until the mystery of Golgotha, the red line up to the first red vertical line. This is then continued in the Middle Ages as scholasticism, white line up to the second red vertical line. Here, the upper red bracket, we have the final tailing off of the old mystery culture through four and a half centuries. And now from the 15th century onwards, a new kind of perceiving begins. We could call it the Galileo perception. We are just about as far in time from the starting point, the small red circle and third red vertical line, as is the mystery of Golgotha from the beginning of the Greek way of thinking, the lower red bracket between the first red vertical line. But while that is an ending, white curve under the lower red bracket, a red evening sky, we are here involved in a beginning, the white curve between the second and third red vertical line. In something which must develop upwards, something we must take up to a considerable height, the culture of Greece was at an ending. We are at a beginning. We shall only be able to fully understand this juxtaposition of an ending and a beginning if, with the help of spiritual science, we study the evolution of humanity from a specific point of view. 
As I have frequently told you and often repeated, it is not without reason that attempts are being made now to bring about an understanding of the human being on the basis of the spiritual science of anthroposophy. The reason is that by far the greatest part of humanity is now confronted by a significant possibility for the future. You see, it is important to take seriously the fact that humanity, which has been evolving throughout history, is an organism continuing in its development. Just as the individual organism reaches sexual maturity with subsequent epochal transitions, so have similar epochal transitions taken place throughout history. Today, people still frequently counter teachings about repeated Earth lives with the argument that one doesn't remember any former lives on Earth. Those who interpret the historical evolution of humanity as being that of an organism in development, as I explained just now, ought not to be surprised, if they are entirely realistic about that evolutionary history, by the fact that individuals today do not recognise their former earthly lives in the ordinary sense. Let us ask ourselves what it is that we remember in ordinary life. We remember something we thought about. We do not remember what we did not think about. Think of all the daily happenings that go by unnoticed. You do not remember them because you did not think them, even if they perhaps took place in your immediate vicinity. You can only remember something which you have thought. Well, the evolution of humanity in former centuries and millennia was not such that individuals thought in a reasoning way about their own being. Of course, know thyself, like a kind of yearning, has been familiar since the age of Greek thinking, but this know thyself can only be fully realised through the medium of true spiritual knowledge. Only after spending a whole lifetime thinking properly about ourself, something for which humanity has only now become sufficiently mature, shall we be prepared in our next life. To remember the previous one. One must have thought about something before becoming capable of remembering it. In our present time only those, and there are more than a few, who formally learn through initiation, though not necessarily in the mysteries, to look properly at themselves are capable of looking back to former earth lives. It is also the case that human beings undergo a transformation with regard to their bodily development. These things can be observed through spiritual science, but not physiologically. Humanity is not now as it was 2,000 years ago with regard to its bodily con constitution, and in another 2,000 years it will again not be the same as it is today. I have often spoken about this. Human beings are now living towards a future time in which, to put it simply, their brains will be externally different in their construction by comparison with today. The brain will be capable of remembering back to former Earth lives. But those who have not prepared for this by contemplating their own self will only experience this capability as, to use a modern expression, a kind of inner nervousness, an inner deficiency. They will not discover what they are lacking in a humanity which has become capable through its bodily maturity of looking back to former lives on Earth. If they have not made preparation for looking back, then they will not be able to look back. They will experience this capability only as a deficiency. That is why, by recognising the capacity for transformation possessed at present by humanity, the spiritual science of anthroposophy can guide human beings to self-knowledge. What I am hinting at is that even today we can already indicate what that special experience will be like when it becomes possible to take earlier lives on Earth into account. In our present time, these nuances of feeling will be possible only for a few individuals, although there will be more and more as time goes on. These nuances of feeling are not much taken into account as yet, but let me describe what they will be like when they begin to occur. Individuals will be born into the world and will say, as I live among others, I am indeed being educated for a specific type of thinking, either consciously or unconsciously. Thoughts rise up in me. I am being born and educated into a certain type of imagining. But at the same time, as I observe my external environment, my thinking and imagining do not really fit in with that external environment. This nuance of feeling is already present in some individuals. 
they are obliged to think in a way which makes it appear as if external nature were telling them something entirely different, as if external nature was asking something quite different of them. Formerly, when such individuals appeared who sensed this discrepancy between what they should think and what external nature was telling them, they were laughed at. Hegel, for instance, is a classic example of this. He expressed certain ideas, of course, of course not all Hegel's ideas, thoughts are foolish, about nature and compiled them systematically. Then the Philistines came and said, these may well be your ideas about nature, but look at this process or that process and you'll see that's not how it is. To which Hegel replied, all the worse for nature. Of course, this is quite paradoxical, and yet there is subjectively something perfectly reasonable in this attitude. It is quite possible to adopt innate thoughts on the one hand, while at the same time saying that nature would have to manifest quite differently if it were to match these. But then, after a while, one begins to grow accustomed to what one has learned from nature. Most people do not notice, once they have come to terms with what they have seen in nature, that they have within them something akin to a double soul, really something resembling two truths. Those who do notice it may suffer considerably because it brings a mismatch into their soul. What I'm talking about is so far present only in a few individuals and even when it is present they often do not notice it but it will gain the upper hand more and more. People will more and more say, in the way I am through having been born my head is compelling me to form a certain image of nature but it does not really conform to nature. As I live on in my life I begin to adopt what nature is telling me but then I have to create a way out. These ambivalent feelings will be present even more strongly in our soul when we once again return to the earth. We shall have a kind of inner font of thoughts and feelings which will oblige us to say, yes, I do sense how the world ought to be, but it is not like this, it is different. And then we shall once again live our way into this world, learning a second kind of conformity and having to search once again for compensation. What will be the cause of this? Let us assume, see drawing, plate 7, that the human being is coming through birth into physical existence. He brings with him whatever in his thinking and feeling is the result of his previous life on earth. During his absence from the earth, external earthly life has changed in some way. He senses a discrepancy between the thinking he brings with him from his former life on earth and what has come about while he has been absent from the earth. And now he gradually grows accustomed to his new life but does not become fully aware of what might be learned by him about his environment. He becomes aware of it, you could say, as though through a vow. He only processes it after death and then again brings it with him into his next life. Again and again he will live in the duality of his soul life. Again and again he will realise, I am bringing something with me, but in comparison with it, the world is new into which I am entering through birth and in which I am growing up as a physical human being. Through my physical being in this world I am absorbing something which does not entirely enter into my soul and which I will again have to work on after death. Present day human beings ought to find their way intensively into this way of feeling about life. Only by entering in a living way into such things does one become aware of the forces pulsing through one's existence but of which one otherwise remains entirely unaware yet we are interwoven with them. If we do not endeavour to enter into these forces with our consciousness, they remain in our subconscious and to some extent make us ill in our soul. We will become increasingly aware of this discrepancy between what we retain from our former life and what we prepare during our present life for the next one. And because we will feel this discrepancy ever more strongly, we will need an inner mediation, a genuine inner mediation. And the question will become ever more urgent as to how we can find such an inner mediation. We can only find an answer to this question if we consider the following. I have often explained that as human beings in ordinary life between waking up and falling asleep, we are fully awake in our lives of thoughts and concepts. The life of thoughts and concepts signifies full wakefulness, but even when we are awake, Full wakefulness is not present in our life of feeling. 
even when we are fully awake in respect of our concepts and thoughts, our feelings are at the level of dreams. Those who are able to investigate this sphere know through direct insight that in our consciousness our feelings are no more alive than this. It is only the concepts by which we describe our feelings that make this seem otherwise. Our feeling life as such surges up from the depths of consciousness in such a way that what thus surges up resembles a dream. And in the way our will lives, it is for us something which is asleep, even when we are awake. We are asleep as regards our will. So we bear within us free states of consciousness, even when we are awake. We go about during the day in a state of wakefulness as regards our life of thoughts and concepts, but we deceive ourselves that we are also awake in our will because we make concepts about what our will accomplishes. What rises up into our consciousness is only a concept of what our will accomplishes, not what is actually experiencing. We dream in our feelings and we sleep while our will is at work. However, when we apply imaginative insight to what is dreaming in our feelings, we see that wisdom, although in many it is unwisdom, is present not only in our thoughts and concepts, but also in our feeling life. There is wisdom in our thoughts and also in our feeling and in our will. As regards human existence as it is today, we can really only speak clearly about what lives in our thoughts and concepts and as to what lives in our world of feeling, our ideas are really no different from dreams, nevertheless wisdom is there also. Someone seriously applying to his own soul the exercises described in my book Knowledge of the Higher World is most likely to discern a certain inner surging of his soul, rather dreamlike and no more. No more regular for most people than ordinary dreaming. But it is possible fairly soon to create enough order in this inner experience for someone to notice that the logic in this inner experience, sometimes a very grotesque logic, and the most varied shreds of thoughts come together, running as though in a dream. Certainly, sometimes the most peculiar logic. We notice that the logic in this inner experience, while not the same, is nevertheless something which is, as I said, a first inner experience, still very primitive of a kind which can be recognised by someone who even not very often applies to his own soul what is described in knowledge of the higher worlds. When one immerses oneself in this surge of waking dreams, a new reality emerges with regard to the ordinary reality of external life. One notices quite soon that a new reality is emerging. One also notices quite soon that there is wisdom in all this too, but a wisdom which one cannot grasp, for which one feels insufficiently mature with regard to bringing it into full consciousness. It eludes one again and again and one doesn't know what to do. So then one notices, or may notice, that not only does wisdom surge through the upper layer of one's consciousness in ordinary daytime wakefulness, but that below this there is also another layer of consciousness which only seems illogical because that is how one describes it through being unable to grasp its wisdom. We can say that once we have fully attained imaginative insight, these waking dreams cease to be as grotesque as they appear to be in ordinary life, for they are now permeated with a wisdom which indicates another kind of reality, namely a world which differs from the sense-perceptible world we can comprehend without ordinary wisdom. In ordinary life, it is only the world of feeling which surges up into our consciousness from that lower layer of consciousness. And from an even lower layer, the world of will surges up, which in its turn is also permeated by wisdom. We too are linked with this wisdom, although we are most certainly incapable of bringing it up into our ordinary consciousness. We can say then that as human beings we are ruled by three layers of consciousness. The first is the consciousness of thoughts and concepts in which we live during the daytime. The second is an imagination consciousness. And the third is an inspiration consciousness which, which remains very deeply buried. It certainly works, really works within us, but in ordinary life we are unable to perceive it. If our present-day philosophy were somewhat 
less obtuse it could not fail to notice. I'm not talking to those who know nothing of this philosophy, but actual philosophers really ought to grasp this, though they don't. Our present day philosophy really ought to notice very clearly, indeed much more intensely, what a great difference there is between the truths we observe on the basis of external nature and what we find in the sciences, for example mathematics and geometry, which we also use in our endeavour to comprehend external nature. With some justification we can say that regarding the truths we gather by means of external observation, in the history of philosophy this has been said so often that the philosophers themselves ought to find it superfluous. We can never actually claim total certainty. Kant or Hume have demonstrated this very clearly by their grotesque statement. Although we observe that the sun rises, our observation will never give us the right to claim that it will rise again tomorrow. We are merely concluding from the fact of the sun having always risen hitherto that it will rise again tomorrow. So this is what happens with truths we have gained externally through observation. But this is not the case with mathematical truths. Once we have understood them, we know that they will hold good forever. Those who know and can prove for inner reasons that the square on the hypotenuse equals the sum of the squares on the other two sides will also know that no one will ever be able to draw a right angled triangle to which this does not apply. There is a difference between these mathematical truths and those we know from external observation. We know this as a fact, but we are not in a position to understand the reason for it by using the means provided by present-day research. The reason for it is that mathematical truths arise out of the lowest layer of our consciousness and, without us realising it, come shooting up into our uppermost consciousness, where we see them inwardly. We possess the mathematical truths because we ourselves act mathematically in the world. We walk we stand and so on, we follow straight lines. We receive our inner view of mathematics through our will-based relationship with the external world. Mathematics arises down below in the third layer of consciousness, whence it shoots up. So strictly speaking, even though in this case the origin is not present in our ordinary consciousness, we have a very clear idea of at least a part of this lower down consciousness. It is from there that mathematical and geometrical ideas rise up to us. It is only the middle layer which is dreamlike, confusing. The middle layer has a quality of dreamy confusion. Up here in our little upper story where our ordinary daytime consciousness resides, we are quite clear. That is why there is clarity in us with regard to what rises up to us from the third layer of consciousness. But what lies in between is for most of us a confused waking dream. It is very important that we should be clear about this fact. In those four and a half centuries the Greeks were very familiar with this consciousness. They took into themselves this consciousness, I this consciousness which they held as a remnant of mystery culture. And this is a purely Luciferic element. It is purely Luciferic. I described it to you the other day. It is the intellectualistic culture. It is very clear in our head. It is permeated with wisdom, with a genuinely accepted wisdom. It is a Luciferic element in us. Luciferic is written on the board, see plate 7. And down there is what pres present day scientists are so fond of, what Kant was already so fond of that he said, there is only as much science with regard to nature as there is mathematics in it. This is the aromatic element rising up through our human being. This is the aromatic element. Aromatic is written on the board, the scheme is now complete, see plate, plate 7. It is not enough to know that something is correct. We know that the things we understand intellectually in our head are correct. But this is a gift from the Luciferic element. 
And we know that mathematics is correct, but we owe this mighty correctness of mathematics to our man who sits within us. And the most doubtful element resides in the middle, those dreams which seem to surge illogically. And let me now introduce a further feature to help you comprehend fully the whole importance of this matter. The fact is that all this mathematical comprehension of the world put forward by Galileo or Giordano Bruno stems from that deeper layer of consciousness. Four and a half centuries have elapsed since we began to take this in. Four and a half centuries since we have been endeavouring to introduce this aromatic element into our human thinking and feeling. While the last echoes of the mystery culture in Greek thinking shone into the brightest clarity of consciousness, that which will not attain its chimborazo until the future begins to rise up in the deepest, darkest layers of our consciousness. The soul life which we human beings possess is really like the beam of a pair of scales holding the balance between the luciferic element on the one side and the aromatic element on the other. The only difference is that the luciferic element is located in the awakeness of our head while the aromatic element lies down below in the realm of wisdom which permeates our will. In between we have to search for balance in something which initially does not appear to be permeated by anything. How does wisdom enter into this middle part of the human being? As he exists in the world at present, his head is held by Lucifer while his metabolic wisdom, his limb wisdom, is held by Araman. But as far as the heart is concerned, this is the sphere which must receive order just as much as is already present in the wisdom of the head through head logic and in what contains the aromatic influence through mathematics, through geometry and whatever arises through rational observation of nature. Through what does inner logic, inner wisdom and orientation enter into the middle part of the human being? Through the Christ impulse, through that which entered into earthly culture by means of the mystery of Golgotha. The view of anatomy in spiritual science shows us what is meant by the culture of the head. It also shows us the culture of the metabolism. And in addition it shows us the sphere of organisation which lies between these two and also what it needs. To be permeated by the Christ impulse is what belongs to our nature as human beings. We may ask, hypothetically, what would be the situation if the mystery of Golgotha had not entered into earthly evolution? Well, the human being would still possess the wisdom of the head and he would also still have what has come into being within him since the 15th century. But as regards the middle part of his being, he would be empty and void. He would increasingly feel the dictomony between these other two inner spheres. And he would be incapable of creating a situation of balance. We can only bring about a situation of balance by imbuing ourselves ever more with, and more with the Christ impulse, which creates the balance between the luciferic and the aromatic element. So we can say that the four and a half pre-Christian centuries bestowed upon us, the last remnants of the ancient mystery culture as a preparation for the mystery of Golgotha, which has established itself in us like a head memory of that ancient mystery culture. And in more recent times, another four and a half centuries have been preparing our being for a new spiritual direction, a new kind of mystery culture. For these two to become linked together, it was necessary for the mystery of Golgotha to be placed objectively into human evolution. Seen from outside, human evolution follows its course in such a way that the mystery of Golgotha is placed into it as an objective fact. Inwardly, however, human evolution proceeded towards the 15th century after which it received a new impetus, which I've described to you as an Araman impetus. Through this, you will truly sense that humanity needs the possibility of building a bridge between the one and the other. It is in this way that we can inwardly comprehend the threefold human being and we shall comprehend him even more exactly when we link what I have said today with something I have also mentioned repeatedly. For the ancient Greek with those last remnants of the old mystery culture 
it would have been impossible except in a few decadent individuals and even then not to the extent that is possible now. It would have been impossible for him to be an atheist. Atheism is basically a new phenomenon, at least in its more radical configurations. But an ancient Greek properly imbued with dialectics still had feeling in his thinking. When we know this and then have a look at atheism, at that utter denial of the divine, we can see what is really at the bottom of atheism. Of course, one must apply the methods of spiritual science to recognise this. Atheists are solely those people who have, usually in very delicate structural conditions, some organic disorder. Atheism is in reality a disease. This is the first thing we have to take into account that atheism is a disease. When our organism is entirely healthy, its various components cannot work together in any other way than in the feeling that our origins lie with the divine. Ex Dio Nassimo. There is though also a second aspect. An individual can have a sense for the divine and yet be incapable of having a sense for the Christ. We do not differentiate very clearly in such matters nowadays. We too easily make it do with words in other matters too. When one investigates the real spiritual content of many Western individuals without taking account of their words, they say they believe in the freedom of the will and so on. It becomes obvious that the whole configuration of their thinking is at odds with what they are saying. It is only in this cultural setting that they are accustomed to speaking of Christ, of freedom and so on. In reality, a great many of those who live among us are nothing other than Turks. What they believe is just as fatalistic, even though this fatalism is often described as a natural necessity, as the beliefs of the Mohammedans. Mohammedanism is much more prevalent than we imagine. When one pays attention not to the words but to the spiritual and soul content, many a Christian is actually a Turk, many Christians are Turks. Thus people call themselves Christian even when they are unable to find how the God whose existence they sense is connected with the Christ. I need only point out the classic example of a modern theologian, Adolf Harnack, who wrote the book What is Christianity? Please carry out this experiment. When reading What is Christianity, cross out the name of Christ wherever it occurs and substitute the name of God. You will find that this in no way alters the content of the book. There is no need for the author to refer to Christ in what he says. All his utterances are generalizations referring to the Father God, who is the foundation of the world. There is no necessity for him to relate what he says to the Christ. Both outwardly and inwardly, what he professes is untrue when he derives his statements from the Gospels. There is no reason for the way he relates them to the Christ. One must find ways of understanding the Christ without equating him with the Father God. Many, especially among the newer Protestant theologians, are unable to make a distinction between the generalised concept of God and the concept of the Christ. Not finding Christ in one's life is different from not finding the Father God. You know, of course, that I have no intention here of doubting the divinity of the Christ. It is just that it is necessary, with regard to the sphere of the divine, to distinguish clearly between the Father God and the Christ God. There is, this is also expressed in the soul life of the human being. Not finding the Father God is an illness. Not finding the Christ is a misfortune. The human being is bound up with the Christ in such a way that he is inwardly dependent on him. He is dependent on something which took place as a historical event. The human being must find a connection to the Christ here on earth. If he does not, this is a misfortune. To be an atheist, not to find the Father God, is an illness, but it is a misfortune not to find the Son of God, the Christ. What does it mean not to find the Spirit, not to have the possibility of comprehending one's own spirituality, and thus not to discover the interconnection between one's own spirituality and the spirituality of the world is a mental deficiency, a weakness of spirit. It is a weakness of soul not to recognise the spirit. 
Please remember these three states of the human soul so that we may tomorrow continue in the right way of these considerations. Please remember what, from a different perspective, I have told you today about those three consciousnesses and whom we must find when we are in full good health. Not to find him is an illness. Not to find the Christ is a misfortune. Not to find the spirit is a weakness of soul. It is in this way that the parts of the human being differ from one another. It will become ever more important to enter into these concrete matters of soul life and not to remain always in generalised, indistinct, hazy views. Yet nowadays people are very much inclined towards the hazy view. It is an essential task of our time to replace the inclination towards the hazy view with a view which enters into the concrete aspects of soul life. 